but hopefully you should be able to see um, my slide presentation. Is that true? Okay, I'm seeing head nods, so that's good. Um, I wanted to add that for the recording aspect of it, uh, we'll be recording the presentation, so you should be able to, so what will be shown in the recording uh, for the majority of the presentation will be um, just my slides that are being shown, and then it'll have the audio there. So if you would prefer to not be seen in the video or uh, present in the in the recording at all. Um, if you want to save your questions until the end, we could easily chop off the Q&A section too, if that's helpful for anyone. Um, the other thing that, well, I guess what I wanted to start uh, by saying, I appreciate the, the intro from Karen. So um, I have uh, been keeping chickens myself for about 10 years. Uh, prior to that, since the age of three, I suppose. I've kept nearly every other animal that you could possibly keep. Um, so I have a, a lot of, a lifetime of animal husbandry experience. Um, my background, otherwise I have a couple degrees in wildlife ecology. So looking at, at systems and ecological systems and recently through the chicken work did a lot of work with urban agriculture and food systems here in New England, which is how Karen and I got uh, introduced initially, I think. Um, I have, uh, Let's see, what else was I gonna say? Uh, five years as a veterinary technician, a variety of other experiences. And at this point, um, I think I've worked with uh, somewhere around 200 coops and easily over a thousand birds in those coops in the greater Boston area. Um, and recently I've done some consultations for folks in other states across the country too. So that's been a, a fun addition. Um, so hopefully, so the information that I have for you today um, is based on my experiences uh, raising chickens, uh, hatching chickens, keeping chickens, and also with um, all of my clients and their coops and flocks. So I like to joke that um, I made all the mistakes so you don't have to, uh, but that's where this info is coming from, is to try to help get everybody set up as well as, as is practical for you uh, as early as is possible so that you can avoid some of the common um, headaches and issues. Um, when that happens, chickens are actually ridiculously easy to keep. So I mentioned I've kept a lot of different animals in my life. I personally find that chickens, when their space is well set up, are the easiest pet uh, to keep, even easier than cats, I think. So um, hopefully we'll, we'll get you all set up uh, to make your chicken, chicken keeping life um, happy and, and full of ease and happy, healthy chickens. Um, Oh, and also thanks to, to CMAP, of course, for hosting this workshop. Uh, I appreciate it. I've been doing a couple other classes this spring. Um, you, you all who have joined us are not alone in having decided to uh, pull the trigger on getting chickens this year. And it's a, a hot topic right now. So I'm glad that you're here with us and uh, getting some good, what hopefully will be good info. So with that, I'll dive right in. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm probably going to go to about... Uh, I'm, I'll try to keep it as close to four o'clock for an end to the informational portion of this, so we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, but uh, if you missed it earlier, there should be an outline in your email inbox. Um, that's an outline for the course. Uh, and feel free to follow along, or if you want to print that and take notes, there are sections for notes in there too. Um, my presentation may not exactly follow the order of what's in the outline, but all of the sections should be there, so that hopefully will be clear. Um, if you do have any questions in the middle of the presentation, feel free to hit the raise hand feature, um, and Karen will be able to see that, I think, and let, a, let me know uh, that there's a question. Um, with that, I'll get going. So, um, most of you, oh, Karen, I didn't hear that. Yeah. Why don't we test the hand raising button? Oh, sure. That's great. Would someone like, or many people like to hit the little hand raise? Oh, oh there. And they come great. to the top. Beautiful. Excellent. Thank you. So I thank, will be able thank to see you those. for that. And, and All right. Good. Thank you very much. That's perfect. Thanks, everyone. Um, so uh, most of you probably are fully aware of why you are thinking about keeping chickens. Um, I think that many, uh, many others probably are in a similar boat as you. So a lot of people, especially right now, are wanting to have a little more control over where their food comes from um, and a little bit more awareness of what went into it. Um, 
to be a little more connected with their food sources and uh, to have that be a little more local. Um, the, <coughs> there's some evidence, there are not, not a lot of studies that have been done, but some evidence to show that um, the nutritional value of backyard eggs is higher than commercial eggs. Makes sense to me because what they're eating, they tend to be eating a, a much wider variety of things. They tend to be healthier and have slightly more robust immune systems. Um, so the, the eggs definitely have a little bit more oomph to them. Um, I have cheaper there with a question mark uh, because they keeping your own chickens is not going to be cheaper than the $3 dozen of eggs that you can get at the store. So in case that's why you're thinking about doing it, uh, you have to be at a, a much larger scale than a typical backyard situation in order for the cost benefit analysis to, uh, to switch itself there. Um, I see that someone just raised your hand. So if you, if you raised your hand before when we were testing it and you don't actually have a question, if you could unraise your hand. And if you do actually have a question, uh, leave your hand raised and um, we can unmute you. Let's see. It's going down. Um, Marie, did you have a question? Nope, okay, great. So I think there's one person with a hand raised. All right, I'm going to lower it so we don't. Okay. Good. Okay, great. Good. Um, backyard chickens make fantastic pets. I think uh, a lot of you probably have some awareness of that. They're really, they're, uh, they each have their own personalities and um, they are hilarious and they all have their own voices and they uh, are, it's, it's this own little um, dramatic chicken TV show that you get to go watch all day, every day, and it's really funny. Uh, and they're very endearing. They um, tend to be very personable pets. Uh, they'll interact with you quite a lot. They respond very well when you come out with treats and they get very excited um, and a number of other things. So they're, they're really great. Um, the pastoral aesthetic, I know for a lot of folks in slightly more urban areas, so a lot, a lot of my chicken keeping um, experience was in Boston. So I started in Somerville right near one of the major tea stations. And uh, that's the, the train for those of you who are not in, in Boston. Um, and then uh, had them uh, in Brighton, which is another, which is technically in the city of Boston. Um, and it's a great way to bring a little of that sort of country farm life into what would otherwise be an urban or suburban setting in a way that's very manageable. Um, they also are really great additions to a garden. So speaking of the ecology of things, you can um, have chickens as part of your garden ecosystem. They will eat uh, plants that, you know, seedlings or spent plants that you've pulled up, toss that in the, in the run and they'll chew those up. They produce great poop that you can compost that then goes back in your garden for, for extra uh, good soil. Um, they eat lots of bugs. So that's really kind of a nice part of your, your little system there. Um, and I wanted to show in this picture here, uh, that bottom picture, this was sort of an accident. Some friends brought some commercial eggs over for, um, we had a brunch one day. So you can tell in this, speaking, going back to the healthier or not, my backyard eggs are the ones that are nice and bright and orangey with and really firm and a little bit bigger. And these other ones that are a little bit wan, uh, a little bit sort of pale looking and kind of squishy, those are the, the store-bought eggs. And uh, as a scientist, I have to acknowledge that part of that may be time since laid and refrigeration aspects because I don't refrigerate my uh, backyard eggs. But it was still a pretty notable difference to be able to see them all in one bowl like that. Um, very very eye-opening, as it were. Um, <clears throat> some very basic uh, chicken info. So all chickens are the same species, scientifically speaking. Uh, there are a number of different breeds within them. So this is kind of similar. I'm, I'll make a lot of analogies today to dogs. Uh, all dogs are the same species, but within them you have different breeds. And within any one breed, you might have a standard size and a toy size. You might have a um, chocolate versus yellow versus black colors and all that sort of thing. So there's a lot of similarities there. Um, the South Asian red jungle fowl is the, uh, the species that all chickens are descended from. Gallus gallus domesticus is the species name there. Um, we started domesticating chickens about 8,000 years ago. It's been a really long, long history that we've had with these uh, critters as a domestic um, food producer for us. Um, this little girl here in the corner, 
<laughs> is a, um, a, a breed called a Old English Game, a standard size Old English Game, but this is about what the, the historical uh, species looked like, something similar to this. So a medium sized ground dwelling bird um, that blends in quite well with the ground uh, and leaves and such for camouflage. Um, and they're a really great little bird. Um, terminology wise, they are all chickens uh, in the same way that all dogs are dogs or all horses are horses. Uh, if they're older than one year, a female is a hen, a male is a rooster or a cock. If they're younger than one year, a female is a pullet, a male is a cockerel. Sometimes people consider them a pullet up until they start laying and then they call them a hen. Uh, it's a little little variable there, but the official definition is uh, that, that one year old switch. Um, Bantam versus standard or large fowl. This is, like I said, similar to uh, in dogs, you have standard size or toy or teacup or whatever the different sizes that have been bred. So in this case, uh, bantam are the small size ones. Um, you still see this in a sort of in daily life with um, bantam weight in boxing and wrestling. And that comes from cockfighting uh, and that being a really common term for that. Um, standard or large fowl are the larger sizes. Uh, we'll talk about breeds in a little bit more detail in a moment, but many bantam breeds have been bred down from a standard size breed, again, similar to dogs. There are a few um, bantam breeds that are considered a true bantam, where that breed was developed separately from having been bred down by size from a, an existing um, standard size breed. Um, and a really common myth is that you need to have a rooster to have eggs. Not true. So that helps for a lot of folks who are in an urban or more suburban setting um, because sound or the noise of a rooster is one of the one of the limiting factors. So, <coughs> excuse me, uh, knowing that you don't have to have a rooster helps quite a lot, um, but they will continue to lay eggs uh, regardless of whether or not there's um, that extra presence of a uh, little of a boy running around their, uh, their little pen. Um, there are a lot of ways to get them. I noticed in your um, survey responses to, uh, for the registration that many of you already have them. So you know the answer to this question already or you have chicks on the way. Uh, so congratulations for all the new chick parents and soon to be chick parents um, in our audience today. Um, you may or may not have gotten them through the mail uh, from, to order, order them from hatcheries, um, or you maybe got them at the local feed store. Many of you probably discovered that uh, this year, because this is such a popular thing that people are, are deciding to take on, there is, um, it's very challenging to find a lot of uh, birds right now. Uh, everything's sold out for another few months in a lot of cases, so um, that is a common, common thing for a lot of folks. Um, you can get adult birds through the mail too. Uh, there are some, a few different um, online uh, community sites where people will sell older birds uh, and they can ship them too. I'm personally, chicks do pretty well in, in the same way that younger animals are often more resilient to change uh, than older animals. It's similar with chicks versus older birds when it comes to mailing them. Um, Chicks still have, when they're, when they're mailed as day olds, they still have their yolk sac for a couple days. Um, temperature is really the, the biggest consideration, but they tend to bounce back pretty quickly. Adult birds, um, it can be a little bit trickier. Also, uh, for many of you may or may not know that there's a vibrant, in nearly any place in our country, there's a vibrant local community of folks who keep chickens. So there are often um, some birds available through that, uh, resource if you can get connected with them. And if anyone has questions about that and you're in a different area, let me know. I'd be happy to try to connect you with folks. Um, not right now because of uh, current restrictions, but typically in this season and pretty much through the end, the probably mid fall at least, there are events that are known as chicken swaps. So these are little community events where people will get together and um, sell extra birds that they have. So if you're hatching, if you're a hobbyist who's hatching uh, eggs, um, you, you're never quite sure what proportion of them are gonna hatch. So you might put uh, 12 in the incubator when you know that you want six ultimately as your flock. So if you think of hundreds of people doing this in a particular region, uh, you end up with a lot of potential extra little chicks. So that's where these swaps sort of started, uh, was a chance for people to find find homes for birds that they 
are not able to keep. Um, breeders also will raise birds for, so right now a lot of the breeders that I've worked with are raising out this year's younger birds and then they'll decide which ones they want to keep for their breeding, um, breeding lines and which ones they want to let go to other homes. So in the fall there, I would expect there will be, um, there typically is more birds that are a little bit older available, which is kind of nice. This year in particular as well, uh, I kind of expect that a lot of folks who decided to get chicks um, may or may not decide, uh, especially if they didn't take a class like this and learn all the info that they need, may or may not decide in the next handful of months that they got uh, into more than they were prepared for. So I would not be at all surprised if there's um, a few additional older birds available out in the world in the next few months. Um, the MSPCA here in Massachusetts also does have chickens. Um, so uh, again, in another few months, that probably will be a good resource. Typically, they tend to mostly have roosters uh, because a lot of the folks who are getting chicks right now, possibly, but hopefully not, any of you uh, may end up with ones that they ordered as females that end up not being females. Um, and so they're trying to find homes for them. And then one of the things that I do is uh, help people get connected with the local community. So I can either connect people with, um, there's some great Facebook groups um, where you can uh, find local hobbyists and breeders who might have birds available. Some of them are a little fussy with um, any sale of animals because Facebook has some restrictions on different groups. So you need to be a little cautious about that, but, um, but that's an option. Or uh, I will find source birds and deliver them uh, for people and help with uh, setup and flock integration and all that too. So I am also a potential resource there. Um, we're gonna talk about breeds for a little bit because I know for, for those of you who have not yet uh, gotten your birds, this is probably something you've been finding lots of information out there about. And for those of you for, who already have them, I'm sure you did a bit of research in choosing your, your breeds too. So um, note that anything that I say here is based on experiences that I've had and there are exceptions to everything. So uh, if I say that a particular breed maybe is one that I don't tend to like in backyard flocks and that's one of the ones you have, don't worry, it'll be fine. Um, these are just sort of general guidelines uh, and in my experience, nearly every breed that I have encountered does just fine in a backyard flock, um, depending on how you set up your coop and what sort of other um, considerations you give them in, the, uh, in your flock to balance behaviors and all that sort of thing. So if you have any specific questions about that, um, we could talk about that more in a minute too. Um, in general, chicken breeds, again, like dog breeds, um, are utilitarian based in terms of their purpose. So uh, primarily you have your laying breeds, you have your meat breeds, and you have your dual purpose breeds, which are ones that were developed for a small homestead flock where you could have a good laying flock and then also have a table bird when you, when you needed one that was gonna be a, a decent weight. Um, recently, and for a lot of you, there are a lot of other considerations about um, temperament, like whether or not a particular breed makes good pets or, uh, or are maybe a little bit more skittish or not. Um, conservation and history comes into play. Uh, I'm, many of you may remember that prior to, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, all of the eggs at the grocery store were always white because we as a culture decided that white eggs were better. Um, there are many fewer breeds that lay white eggs than brown eggs. And so we started to see a decline in a lot of the brown egg laying breeds at that time, which is really kind of interesting. And then a little while ago, we started uh, advocating for brown eggs again, and now we have a lot of brown eggs. Um, but there are a couple of breeds that the groups are working on developing those breeds so that they can conserve them uh, so that we don't lose them as a as a breed in the world. Um, and then the history aspect of it too. Uh, there are a couple breeds that were developed in specific areas. So here, many of those, to be honest, are were developed here in New England because this is uh, where our agricultural communities in our country started. Um, so like there's a the Rhode Island Red, of course, is a favorite developed in Rhode Island. There's also a New Hampshire Red, which is a phenomenal breed. Um, there's a breed called a Buckeye that was developed in Ohio. So if you are interested in an association with a particular area or particular history, um, that could be a consideration too. Um, of course, we love the different, um, the way that they look. So there's some example in these pictures here of um, many different colors. Uh, the ones here in the middle that are fluffy, this is a breed called a silky. 
she's missing her beard because uh, she was getting muddy and picked at a little bit. But um, silkies were bred to be, have all down feathers. So there are some considerations for keeping them because they don't have the uh, uh, evolutionarily developed protections that the other, that many of the other breeds have, um, but they're super fun. Um, some of the different color types, this one up here uh, in the top right is called a Milfleur uh, color Belgian bearded de clay. So Belgian bearded de clay is the breed, Milfleur is the color. Every single feather is brown with a black chevron and a white spangle on the end. So it makes them look, get this beautiful speckled look. And there are a few other color types that have that speckly look. Um, this guy here is um, what's called a silver laced color bird. He's a bantam cochin, if you're wondering the breed. But silver laced, every feather has white in the middle with black lacing on it. Um, so there are lots of different colors. This one here is, uh, has a feather gene called the frizzle gene, which makes all their feathers curl backwards. Um, my friend's, a friend of mine uh, said that she was basically a little walking peony flower, which I think is pretty accurate. Um, and then some other considerations are the broodiness or cold hardiness thing. You'll, you'll hear people talk about cold hardiness quite a lot. Um, like I was saying a moment ago, in my experience, there are very few breeds. If you've designed your coop and run structure well, um, here in New England, there are very few breeds that are not gonna be fine in your flock. So this idea of cold hardiness, um, in my experience has much, much more to do with how you've built their structure than it does with the breed itself. So for example, some of the breeds that have a little bit bigger comb, like these two here that are a little bigger than say these guys, um, their comb can be prone to frostbite if you have a lot of drafts in your coop in the winter time and it's really cold. If you don't have drafts in your coop, you could have a huge comb and you'll never have a frost, frostbite problem. Uh, if you don't have drafts, but you still have good ventilation anyway. So we'll talk about coop design in a moment. But this, this cold hardiness idea is something that most of us here in New England, especially in an urban setting where there are lots of wind breaks, really don't have to worry about too, too, too much. There are also some other things you can do with your coop design and some other products out there now that can help um, take the edge off the cold a little bit too, though. Um, Again, if you've designed it well, it's really not necessary. Uh, the broodiness factor is another big one. So this, the silky here, um, and also the bantam cochins, what this this little guy is, uh, are both breeds that are prone to being broody. Um, this is one of those many words that we have in our regular lexicon that comes straight from chicken keeping. Um, to be broody in terms of a chicken is to go and sit in a dark space and sit there and be kind of grumpy uh, for a long time. Um, when they go broody, it's like there's a, a switch that flips in their body that tells them that they're supposed to be sitting on their eggs uh, for 22 to 23 hours a day or more. Um, the reason for that for hatching is so that they're sitting there and they're getting that temperature up really hot to, for the eggs to hatch. If they don't have eggs because you're collecting them, but it's a breed that's prone to being broody, they may, sit, they may go broody anyway, even if there aren't any eggs there. And because they're not hatching chicks that will then sort of snap them out of that in 21 days when the chicks hatch, they can sit there and be broody for months at a time. Um, so in a backyard flock, many people try to go with breeds that are less likely to be broody. That said, any individual bird in any breed could be one that has a tendency to be broody versus individual birds uh, of a breed that is uh, known to be more broody that might not. So there's a lot of overlap in that. Um, so which is to say you can choose the breeds that are less likely to be broody and still end up with one that likes to be broody. Um, going back to the, the types. So like I said, layers, meat birds, dual purpose. Um, the ornamental or exhibition breeds, this is sort of along with the, the idea of uh, the appearance being why you might choose one. Um, many of the, especially the breeds that we consider true bantams have been bred for a particular appearance, which is kind of fun. And then the heritage factor that we were talking about, the history. So in these pictures here, this top right is, our, is everyone's favorite foghorn leghorn. That is a white leghorn. Those are known to be one of the best laying breeds. Um, they, and when you say best laying, that's uh, you're talking about usually an average number of eggs that that breed bird will lay in the course of a year. Um, remember that eggs are a seasonal food. Uh, we sort of forget this because there are ways of keeping birds laying uh, year round that are what happen in an industrial commercially produced egg situation. 
Um, but winter is their dormant period. So there usually are a lot of eggs right now. This is egg season in the spring. Uh, and then you'll get fewer eggs in the summer if it's really hot, maybe fewer, definitely fewer in the fall when they're molting because all of their resources are going towards building feathers and then fewer in the winter because they're dormant. You can use lights to keep the day length a uh, particular uh, length, 14 hours, um, to keep them laying throughout the winter, but that's sort of a family by family personal choice of whether or not you have production as your main goal. If you have pets as your as your main goal and the production is sort of a side effect, you might choose to let them have the dormant period for the sun, for the winter, which will help them continue laying a little bit later in their life and also keep their bodies a little bit healthier. Um, part of the reason for that is that um, chickens like like us, like many species, start with a finite number of potential eggs in their system. So once they have laid all the eggs that they have available, they'll that's it, they're done. So um, for many of us who have small, small setups with small flocks, um, you run the, the risk if they stop laying sooner that you have a, a, a coop full of birds who aren't laying and then you have to kind of decide what you want to do about that. If they get to stay and be pets or if you want to try to cycle a few out with some younger birds to get more eggs. So these are all considerations to think of in the long term. We'll talk about that with health a little more too. Um, for meat birds, this one on the top left, that is a Cornish game hen. Uh, this is a show bloodline Cornish game hen, um, They, which means that the show bloodlines, kind of similar if you think to some of the working, working dog breeds, um, they've been bred to be able to grow to adulthood and breed to be able to create more for, for show purposes. The ones that are the actual production birds for meat birds do not live past about a year or so because we've bred them to put on so much bulk so quickly that their skeleton and their tendons and ligaments and, uh, and everything else can't keep up, they just can't. Um, and there are ways of minimizing, of slowing their growth to try to get them to live longer, but um, they really have been bred to put on a ton of bulk really fast. Um, many of you may or may not know that uh, meat birds are usually processed at about eight to 12 weeks. So you never have a flock of meat birds. You have chicks for a couple months and then they get processed. So what a lot of people do is have um, their laying flock, if you do want to have meat production as part of your plan, a lot of people have their laying flock and those are their pets and those they have for, you know, anywhere from five to 15 years or more. Um, and then you have your batch of meat chicks that you order for that season, you raise them up, you send them to your processor or take them to your processor or process them yourself and they go in the freezer and then that's your meat for the year and the ones that are your pets you interact with and they have names and the ones that are the meat you maybe don't hang out with so much um, so I, I know that quite a few people who are doing this for a food production goal that is a, a totally common um, approach to that but know that the meat birds if you get meat breeds um, they're really hard to keep healthy for longer than uh, than the amount of time that we've bred them to, to exist in the world. Um, the dual purpose breeds, like I said, are the ones that um, were bred to be decent table birds and also lay uh, quite a lot. So this bottom left one here, this is a silver laced Wyandotte. And that's one that's a pretty typical example of a dual purpose breed. Most of the backyard breeds that, that tend to be common are dual purpose birds. Um, they have good, good temperaments. They were bred to be pretty, pretty nice birds. Um, they're big enough that they have some, some meat on them, but also really good layers. Um, I've had mixed experiences with Wyandots specifically. They are a very strong personality bird which means that if you have them in an enclosed space, so you have your, your coop and run that you have in an urban or suburban setting where you can have them in a pest and predator proof area that's closed off most of the time. Um, if, a, if you have a Wyandotte in with another breed that is typically a more docile breed or even an individual that's a little more docile, sometimes the Wyandots can be a little bit overly bossy. Um, so you may just have to introduce some considerations like uh, visual barriers in your run, toys, things to keep them occupied, same as you would do if you had a couple dogs that needed a, something to distract them during the day sort of thing. Um, for ornamental ones, these two bottom ones, this one in the middle, uh, that little dinosaur there is called a modern game. This is a bantam modern game. That bird stands about maybe a foot tall. Um, they look like, like I said, like little dinosaurs. There's a large fowl version of this breed too. Uh, they're one of my favorites. They have really great temperaments and they're actually really good layers. 
Um, and I'm sort of surprised that they don't show up a little more often because who doesn't want a bunch of dinosaurs in their flock? I mean, you already have dinosaurs anyway, because they all are, but those guys are super cute. Um, this one this is a, a male version of that Bel Belgian bearded decay we were looking at just a moment ago. And you can see better in this picture, their flippers that they have. So they have really um, extravagant foot feathering that's a lot of fun and it makes them look like they're running with flippers when they're running across the yard and they're really cute. Uh, this is one of the breeds that's a true bantam and they're one of my favorites. Um, they're really fun. And then this one in the middle here is one called a Dominique, which is one of those, another one of those heritage breeds. And then we have our Muppets. So just to show a little bit more of the ornamental breeds that everyone adores because they're hilarious and great. Um, here's another one of those silkies. So like I said, there are three different um, feather genes. The main is the smooth feather. That's the one that most that all birds have. That's the, the ancestral trait. Um, and then we developed the silky gene that gives them all down feathers and the frizzle gene, which makes all their feathers curl backwards. Um, keep in mind that both silkies and frizzles uh, cannot fly. So they do not have their primary defense mechanism uh, in place. Um, I also, for the record, don't ever recommend clipping birds' wings. Uh, if your bird is not staying in your yard, it's because they don't have what they need, uh, which is to say they don't have cover, they don't have stuff to do, and wherever is wherever they're going to is more interesting. So um, clipping your bird's wings means that you are taking away their defense mechanism. Uh, it's kind of like with breeding them to be frizzles or suppies. So all that means is that you just have to be a little bit more aware of um, potential risks for these guys. So um, the times that I've had customers or clients lose birds to predators is almost always when they forget to, you, be, you become complacent you forget to close the door to put them back in in the evening and something comes and grabs one of your birds. Uh, these guys, if you have frizzles and silkies, they are, it's just, it's one of those Murphy's Law things. They are almost always the first ones to get grabbed um, for whatever reason. So that's something to keep in mind because they also invariably are everybody's favorite. Uh, so it's just a, it's, it's sort of an example of knowing what the potential risks are and then doing what you can to to mitigate those risks. Um, they can also be a little trickier to have because as you can tell by these two here with their elaborate crests and beards, they don't see very well at all. So sometimes they can get picked on by um, other birds that are a little bit more dominant because they just don't see them coming. The, this one in the top right here, this is a Polish frizzle, um, which by the way is what, I'm, uh, what I, I'm fairly positive Big Bird is. So if anyone ever, if that trivia question ever comes up, what kind of bird is Big Bird? is a Polish frizzle chicken. But um, they can have just some, they can be a little more skittish because they just don't see you coming. Um, so it's something, and again, to sort of keep in mind. Um, I want to move along to some other uh, more pertinent things so we can get through the this important stuff. Not that breeds aren't pertinent, but um, uh, like I said, many, many different breeds do really, really well. So there's a lot of variety there. Um, I don't usually talk about chick care in my talks, but given that so many folks like you, so many of you are getting chicks uh, this year, um, I wanted to include a, a section about this. So for those of you who already have them, some of this is going to be uh, info you already know. Uh, for those of you who don't and are preparing, I um, wanted to just kind of go over this. So chicks are, chick care is pretty simple. Um, in that uh, temperature and food and water, uh, it's kind of, you've got a newborn baby. These are, these are basically, those are the really important things to look out for. Um, temperature is key. And I can't stress enough how much ha having access to the appropriate temperatures um, can help alleviate any other potential um, illness issues with your, with your little chicks. Um, they need to be 90 to 95 degrees their first week after hatching, and then you lower that by five degrees each week until you reach whatever your ambient nighttime temperatures are for the most part, um, or until they are fully feathered and have a little bit of mass on them. So they'll be fully feathered depending on the breed by five to six to eight weeks maybe, um, but they still will be very slim for a little while longer. So you, I, I don't, take the heat off fully at night until I know that they're both, uh, that, that those five degree lowering has equaled the nighttime temperatures 
and or that they have all of their feathers and a little bit of body mass to help uh, keep their temperature up. Um, I love this graphic here because it shows that where they should have access to options so that every each individual chick can choose whether they are they themselves are feeling a little too hot or too cold. Um, so you should have the warm zone on one in one section of your brooder and a cooler zone in another section of brooder. And ideally the difference in those temperatures should be like 10 to 15 degrees if you can if you can manage it. Um, you can tell by their behavior how it how it is and whether or not you need to raise or lower your your heat source so if it's too cold they will all be huddled together underneath the heat source because they want to be warm if it's too hot they will all be as far away from the heat as they possibly can get to and if they're just right then you should see them sort of evenly scattered around the space um, there are a couple examples here these are pretty common for people to make a brooder out of like a big a tub um, this one right here is fairly small and uh, even with only a few chicks, like three or four, I would say they'll outgrow this within probably a week, maybe a week and a half. Um, this one's a little bigger, so you probably get away with three or four weeks with that, again with only like three or four birds, um, but to keep that in mind. Uh, they are really dusty, so if you don't, if you have chicks already or you're getting them soon and you don't already have a coop, Note that you will want them out of your indoor living space within three to four weeks of getting them um, because they're messy. And by that point, they'll probably be too big for whatever brooder you have and be jumping out of it all the time and uh, be ready to be in, in a little more space. So that's something to keep in mind for your planning. Um, some different heating options. This, uh, this here is called the Eco Glow by Brinsey, B-R-I-N-S-E-A. Um, it's the brand that makes these. I like these a lot. There's a, they have a really low um, fire risk. Uh, they have a, a thermostat on them that actually that helps um, protect a little bit. And you can raise or lower it. So this the black sides have little channels in them. So you pop it out of the lowest channel and raise it up as they get a little bit bigger. Um, this brooder box again is going to be really way too small, way too soon. But um, these are one of the products that has shown up in recent years once the backyard chicken craze started to pick up a little more. Um, the other classic option is a heat lamp like this. Um, I recommend instead of using a heat bulb, uh, you can get, they're a little more expensive, but you can get a ceramic bulb um, that are designed for reptiles. And actually, hang on one second, I'll show you the one that I have in my, in my room right now because I have a house chicken at the moment. Hold on one sec. So this is a ceramic bulb, so it's it fits in the just the regular top, but it's um, made of ceramic instead of uh, instead of being a heat lamp, um, which I feel has a little bit less of a fire hazard issue. The heat lamps are a big fire hazard, um, so you need to sort of consider that. Um, feed and water. So. For their waterer, you want to make sure that it's not too big. Uh, brand new chicks will drown if they get stuck in a water source. Um, one of the things you can do is put marbles in it to make sure that there's enough space for them to dip their little tiny beaks in, but not to fall in. Um, and to show them where the water is. For those of you, or when you when you get chicks, they usually come with some instructions and they usually tell you to go ahead and dip their beak, which is to say grab them and stick the front of their head in their water um, so that they know where the water is. And uh, you'll see when you do that, that they'll kind of, they'll struggle and they'll be like, ah, what are you doing? And then they'll be like, oh, water, look at that. And they'll drink it. Um, so you can sort of tell if that's been successful. I would add to that too, that you then want to observe them for, um, for the, that first little bit, which you're going to want to anyway because they're adorable, but make sure that you are seeing them actually go to the water by choice and go to the feed by choice so that you know that they didn't just uh, drink or eat because you put them there, but they actually have figured out where it is because that's really important. Um, for feed, um, there are a couple different food options, a starter grower, um, well starter and or grower, and then uh, those also come as a, a mixture. Um, 
if you're feeding just starter, that's only until they're about six weeks. And then uh, you would feed grower from six weeks until they start laying at about five to six months. Um, if you're feeding a starter grower combo, that's fine to continue feeding that until they start laying. Um, and the, stuff, the different things that are in there are just, it's protein level and other nutrients that they, they do or don't need. You do not at all want to feed layer feed to chicks. Um, at least until they get close to laying age. There's not enough protein, there's not enough extra stuff they need for their for, to be growing, and there's way too many minerals, um, like the calcium and the stuff that they need for producing eggs that as chicks are not, too, not super good for them. So you wanna be sure that you have the right feed. Um, I have on here grit before snacks. <laughs> so uh, chickens um, and uh, all birds in general, but uh, chickens especially, they, they don't chew, they don't have teeth. Um, the way that they grind up their food is that they have a gizzard. So in their, in their uh, digestive process, they have first a crop, which is where they store food when they first eat it. Um, and yeah, that'll be right in front and you'll feel it get full when, they're, when they've eaten. And then they have a gizzard and they put little stones in their gizzard and it's like this little grinder that grinds up their food. Chick feed and consequently uh, any processed pelleted feed as well, um, have been cooked and so it's sort of pre-digested so they can digest that just fine. Um, any other food that's not a processed chicken food, so this is veggies, this is um, fruits, this is greenery from the, the garden, this is uh, certainly any grains or any other, anything that's not that chick food, they cannot digest that until they have those little rocks in their gizzard. So you want to be sure that you have chick chick sized grit um, that you can get at any feed store uh, or online um, and that they have access to grit before you start feeding them stuff that's not their regular chick food. So I wanted to be sure and say that. Um, medicated feed versus not. So a lot of people have the misperception that medicated feed is well, I mean, there's a lot of misunderstanding about antibiotics in general out in the world, but um, medicated chicken feed is only medicated against coccidiosis, which is a particular bacterial disease that's very common in, in chickens. Uh, it doesn't treat for anything else. It doesn't protect against anything else, only coccidiosis. Um, many chicks now have the option of being vaccinated for coccidiosis when you order them. Uh, if they have been vaccinated for coccidiosis, feeding them the medicated feed will negate the vaccine. So know if your chicks have been vaccinated for coccidiosis or not, or just don't feed the medicated feed unless you have, you think that there's an issue. If you're keeping, if your chicks come from a good source and are healthy when you get them, and you're keeping them in a space that you're keeping clean and you're feeding them good food and you're keep, keeping track of, of their health and behavior, the likelihood of them getting coccidiosis is very low. So I, I generally do not feed medicated feed unless I think that there's a reason that it would be an issue. Um, so you can keep that in mind. If you want to feed the medicated feed, be sure that they were not vaccinated for coccidiosis. And then I say put it on a stage here, and I think I didn't actually add this picture, um, but maybe I have it up. Oh, no, I don't. Uh, when I say put it on a stage, um, I use a big 16-inch uh, paving stone. Um, they're heavy, but it's also, it's the same thing that I use under the waterer out in the run for the adult birds anyway. So I just put their food and water on top of this paver stone that's a couple inches high, and that helps keep them from kicking all of the bedding into their food and water, which really helps in keeping it all clean. Um, and it sort of helps too, because then that's clear of shavings and you can kind of sprinkle a little food on the paver stone and it helps them see to go pick at it and stuff. So it's a good, good thing for teaching them uh, where their food is. Um, bedding, shavings are a great bedding. Um, I use shavings for everything all the time, uh, in my coop, in the nest boxes. Um, I don't use it in the run. We'll talk about that more in a second, but it's really good. Keep in mind, if you, if you want to use newspaper, some places recommend using newspaper, but it can be really, really slippery. So you can see in this picture here that they have the um, shelf liner, that like rubber shelf liner down to help it be a little bit stickier for the chicks to walk on because you don't there's a condition called splay leg that they can get if they don't have um, a surface that has friction that they can stand on. Um, another option this one here I like because it's a little bit more at, at eye level um, that is something that for I've I don't have any hard data on this this is just purely um, 
anecdotal experience that I've had, but having your chicks more at like tabletop level or, uh, you know, body level rather than on the ground um, can help them with uh, being more tame. Uh, something about you coming to, at them from the same level versus always coming from overhead. Um, again, there's, I don't have any clear data on this. It's just sort of a, an impression that I've gotten uh, over the years. Um, you can transition to the coop, like we said, uh, when they're fully feathered, plus or minus what the ambient temps are. So that, that equation will change depending on where you are, how old your birds are, and what time of year it is, and whether or not we get another crazy freeze. Um, so you'll just have to kind of keep that in mind. If you are able to, if you want to put them out in the coop sooner and you want to put heat in your coop, be very, 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 very careful with how securely you set up your heat source in there. Make sure that the coop has plenty of space. Make sure that you have your ventilation windows uh, at least partially open for airflow. Um, because it can get very, very hot in there very, very fast. And also you have typically a wooden box with bedding as kindling and a heat source and animals which are unpredictable. So um, be really cautious with putting a heat source in your coop, period. Um, other things to, oh, uh, put them in the coop first. So when you put them out there, we'll talk about the uh, coop and run structure in a second, but assuming you have your coop house and your attached run outdoor space, um, I always put birds that are new to a space in the coop first, um, and then you can choose to open the door to let them out in the run when they're ready, but it gives them a chance to get used to where the, the house is. Um, the first couple nights that you let them out into the run, you probably will have to catch them and put them in the coop to know where to roost, and then they'll learn after a couple nights. But those first couple ones, because they haven't had any sort of situation where there's uh, you know, a different space that they need to go into thus far in life, they'll probably need a little training. Um, vaccines. If you are able to choose this when you're getting chicks or if you're able to, to get this from um, whomever you're getting your birds from, uh, I highly recommend having them vaccinated for Merrick's disease. Merrick's is a viral disease that it doesn't have a cure. It doesn't show up until they hit puberty, so about six to eight months old, um, and it's highly contagious. And there's really nothing you can do about it. So, and that said, the vaccine has been shown to be fairly effective. So if you can get the Merix vaccine, definitely do. Um, as far as the other vaccines that are available, uh, you can get them or not. Um, some of, there, there are vaccines available for diseases that are not super common in backyard birds. Um, like uh, Newcastle's is one, uh, you could, you can get it if you want to, but I've, I have never, I personally have not yet heard of a backyard flock that has encountered Newcastle's disease. Um, coccidiosis, like we were talking about a second ago, you could choose to get that vaccine if you want to, um, but if your birds are being kept uh, healthy uh, and being kept clean, then it's probably not going to be too much of an issue. Um, so lot, it's a couple other considerations there. One of the other big things to look out for is a condition known as pasty butt. And this is when they get, um, if they have, it happens when they're stressed. So if you order them through the mail, this is a big thing to look out for for the first, uh, probably the first week or two that you have them with you, um, is to check them every day to make sure that their little bums are expelling all of the material um, fully and that nothing has dried and pasted on uh, in the back. What will happen if that happens is that basically there's, they, there's nowhere for the subsequent poop to go. And as baby chicks, they poop a lot. So you wanna be really, really cautious and check them every single day. If not every single time you pick them up, again, just for that first little bit to make sure that, that everything is moving through and out uh, effectively, because that can be really a really big problem really quickly. Um, with them. Uh, if you're hatching them yourself, there are some other issues that uh, can come up like rye neck or the splayed leg issue if you're if they're on slippery um, bedding and all, there's a few other other things with uh, how how easily they hatch out of their egg and such but if you're not hatching them yourself then that won't be an issue. Um, really quickly for adult chickens um, there are a few other food and um, care 
uh, there are many other things to consider for adult birds. I'm going to kind of breeze through this super quickly because I think most of the folks on the call today have chicks. Um, uh, but this is a good chance actually to say that I will be doing a second version of this course specifically intended for people who have adult birds or have had them for a year or so and want to troubleshoot some other um, common health issues that you get with older birds um, and uh, maybe coop upgrades if you've had them for a little bit and you want to think about um, what else you can do for your coop and such. So that'll be in two weeks, same bat time, same bat channel um, on the 31st. Um, and we'll have a link to that at the end too. Um, so if you do have older birds and you want some more info on that, uh, feel free to join us for that one too. Um, in general, um, they can eat a wide variety of things. Um, the extra feeds that have higher protein, um, backyard chickens actually, uh, many breeds have a tendency to be overweight. Um, so the extra really is just extra. Uh, you want to stick to a 16% protein most of the time unless, unless you know that you have a bird that is characteristically underweight. Um, and then you want to be cautious because of course everyone else will eat that too. Um, and there's some other things to think about there. Injuries and disease. Um, lice and mites are very, very common. This, uh, I was recently talking to a, a friend of mine who um, also deals with a number of different chicken owners. And she said, was saying that this last year was a really bad year for mites. Um, the, the overarching thing to keep in mind is to just be really familiar with your birds. And this goes for your chicks too. Observe them on a daily basis, if you can. Um, know what their be typical behavior patterns are, know what their typical appearance is. And if stuff seems off, um, there's a thing we say in the chicken world that uh, occasionally a bird is uh, NQR, which stands for not quite right. Chickens hide illnesses really, really well. Um, they hide sickness really, really well, uh, such that by the time they're obviously sick, they're very, 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 very sick. So if you notice something that just seems a little off, just that bird is just not quite right, um, that's an indication for you to keep a really close eye on that bird for the next 24 or 48 hours to see if you can catch something a little bit sooner. Um, this to vet or not to vet question, many, many, many people don't take chickens to the vet. I, I, I like to say that they fall somewhere in between um, the family hamster and the family cat when it comes to, to care levels, which is totally fine. As creatures go, they're a relatively, you know, cheap animal um, and vets can be really expensive. That said, you are going to fall in love with this little flock of yours. And I highly recommend knowing what vet you would take them to if you decided to do that well before the, such a time uh, that you're facing that question in the moment. Um, so for those of you in Boston, uh, Angel Memorial will see them, um, though they're very expensive. Uh, I have worked with a fantastic vet at um, Littleton, is it Littleton? Lexington Veterinary Associates in Lexington. Uh, his name is Giles and he's great. I highly recommend him and his pricing tends to be a little bit more um, realistic for the typical chicken owner, uh, I think. Um, but there certainly are options for folks outside of those areas. I recommend calling around a little bit and just knowing what that option is before you need it, um, if you can. And you may choose not to, not to take into a vet. There are a lot of things that you can treat at home um, if you feel capable of doing so. Uh, and I'd certainly be, you're always welcome. Uh, you'll have my, my email address, but you're always welcome to reach out to me. Um, if you have a question uh, about whether or not something needs to see a vet, and it may be that it's something that really doesn't. So um, that's totally, totally acceptable and totally fine too. Um, I do recommend, and this is in the tip sheet, there's a little more information, having a quarantine cage um, prepared, or which is to say have that available. I use a folding black wire dog crate um, for adult birds and having a first aid kit so that when something does come up that doesn't need to go to a vet, um, you're prepared to, to deal with that yourself. Um, I just want to acknowledge that I know it's 4.05 right now, so we're a little behind time. Um, so I'm going to go through coop design and then we'll, uh, we'll get to questions. And that's the last bit that we have here. Um, in summary for chicken care, and this kind of goes with many animals, if you provide adequate housing and keep it clean, make sure they have good food and clean water and know what their behaviors are, uh, you'll have happy chickens and lots of, lots of delicious eggs. 
Um, so for coops, um, I'm just going to give a nod to zoning. Uh, depending on your town, you may or may not have zoning restrictions about um, chicken coops. Uh, for urban areas and suburban areas, this often includes details like how far from the property line it needs to be, um, how maybe a maximum height, maybe some indication of how far from your neighbor's house. Uh, how far from a watershed. So it's good to know all of these things. If you have a permitting process available, I recommend doing it. Uh, what that does for you is it says that uh, if, if someone complains, if a neighbor complains, um, you then have sort of the, the city will sort of have your back as far as um, this person has gone through the steps, they are doing the things they need to do, they have a right to keep their birds and they get to keep them. If you don't have a permit and or your town doesn't allow it and you choose to have birds and someone complains, it may be that the town will say, I'm sorry, you, you don't get to keep them, you have to get rid of them, they're not allowed. So again, with acknowledging what the risks are and doing what you can to mitigate these risks, um, for example, the city of Boston, the entire city of Boston with all of its different neighborhoods, uh, has a permitting process that allows them for citywide, but each neighborhood has zoning that does not allow them, that trumps the citywide uh, zoning. That said, many, many, many people in Boston have them. And if you have a coop that looks nice and that's kept up and doesn't smell and you don't have a rooster and you're balancing your compost properly so that doesn't smell and your coop is designed to be pest proof so you're not attracting uh, mice and rats, um, then you're probably fine because if you're doing all those things and it looks nice and your neighbors know about and like your chickens, you're probably not going to have an issue. If you have your chickens out most of the time and they're getting into your neighbor's garden and destroying it, it's probably going to be a problem. If you have a rooster and they're not allowed and you have your coop 10 feet from your neighbor's bedroom window, that also is probably going to be cause problems. So just kind of keep in mind these different factors when you're, you're putting it in. Um, so chicken care or chicken chicken housing. So in general, um, coop is sort of a tricky word because it both means just the house, and traditionally that's what it was because on on a farm in a homestead setting you never had an enclosed run, you just had the, the house because you had the whole farm for them to run around on. Uh, the run is the aviary part, um, and now we I tend to use coop as a word to mean the entire structure but also to mean the house. So if that um, seems confusing, uh, I will try to keep it clear and I apologize. Um, but in general, your coop for a typical backyard flock has your house and it has your run and they're attached and they are designed to be large enough um, uh, with enough space for the number of birds and the type of birds that you have and secure enough that your flock can live happily and healthily in that enclosed space 365 days a year, 24 seven, and have everything they need to be healthy little happy creatures. Um, considerations, uh, predator and pest prevention. So going back to, to cities and neighbors, the three, three big things that people tend to be concerned about are noise. So not having a rooster helps a lot with that, though sometimes hens can be a little noisy, usually not at five o'clock in the morning. Um, whether or not you're gonna be attracting rodents, and then whether or not it's gonna smell and be gross. So, um, or be, you know, a uh, ugly little thing that's covered in a tarp and that doesn't look nice. You know, those, those tend to be sort of, the, the smell and the appearance tend to be on par as ter in terms of concerns from neighbors. So when you're talking about how you're designing your coop, you wanna make sure that you're making it pest proof. Um, the predator proof is for your own peace of mind and the health of your birds. You wanna know how many, and this is actually probably the key factor, how many birds are you planning to have? Because that will determine the size of the structure that you build um, and what type. So if you have all bantams in your flock, you could get away with a few more in a, the same amount of space versus if you have a standard size bird versus if you have some of the largest breeds. So there are a couple breeds that are the Great Danes and the Irish Wolfhounds of the chicken world. And for them, you maybe need more space for fewer birds. Um, the mobility factor. So I'm not going to talk about chicken tractors too, too much. That's tractor is the word given to a coop and run structure that is intended to be moved around. Um, there's a theory that you can spread the damage and also spread the fertilizer. In most urban and suburban backyard settings, let me back up, let me phrase that a different way. Unless you have a farm with pastures where you are rotating a large area with many birds and, and able to rotate it around, 
um, every day. Uh, the tractor th idea does not work. So in a typical urban and suburban backyard, you just don't have enough space to counteract the amount of damage that your birds in their little enclosed area will do in a certain period of time. You would need to be moving the coop you know, every few hours, depending on the size of it, and you're probably going to run out of possible areas that you have to move it to, uh, which will not allow any one area to be able to rejuvenate itself before they have to be back there again. So it functionally just doesn't work. The other issue with it is that you can't bury wire around the perimeter, which is one of your major pest proofing um, tactics. So I am not at all a fan of chicken tractors in a, like I said, in a typical urban or suburban setting. It's just a lot of work for minimal benefit. Um, what you can do to accomplish those, those things is you can compost the bedding that you clean out of there and uh, use that in your garden and in your other areas. Um, you can uh, acknowledge that the area right underneath your coop is going to be torn up and destroyed um, and let that be. Uh, and then you can, you know, have a, have a coop that's going to be good for them otherwise. I just um, want to jump in yeah, here, Christy. I, I do chicken tractor some of my birds and everything you say is true. <laughs> <laughs> so we have 12 birds. We have almost an acre. I can move them and they don't have to go back on the same spot, but it's a very porous coop. They are slipping out. Every time you move it, you have to make sure you've got it set right. Um, and they leave a, an uneven surface behind. Um, so, you know, it's maintenance to keep up behind them. So. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And I appreciate that. <clears throat> That's what I've, what I've seen for others too. Yeah. You end up with, with no lawn or no, no good area instead of just having one area that's destroyed and the rest of it moderately. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so moving along. Uh, oh, I did also want to talk about winter and, um, uh, just keeping in mind how far away from your house you want to shovel to get to them because they are still going to need relatively daily care in the wintertime. They'll need their feed and water um, refreshed and, and whatnot. Uh, and also whether or not your structure that you're building is snow proof. Like you want enough of a slope on the roof that the snow will come off um, and all that sort of thing. Um, you want to be sure that you have uh, power that you can get out there. Having a water defroster is a life changer. Um, so you definitely want to be able to run, if nothing else, a uh, you know, 100 foot heavy duty extension cord out there um, for the winter time. Um, so there are a lot of different coop options. Um, the, the DIY versus prefab tends to be the big question that a lot of people have. So do you build it yourself or do you buy one from somewhere or do you potentially hire someone to build it for you? Um, this question for all potential DIY projects, I think, is a time versus money versus quality question. How much time do you have available or how quickly do you need it done? How much do you have in your budget um, and how good do you want it? Uh, and those those three factors, like sliders on a you know on an equalizer, um, tend to sort of balance each other out one way or another. The greenness factor is whether or not you want to use reclaimed materials or what you're choosing for materials and that sort of thing. Um, so these pictures on the left were both DIY versions that built by people who have contractor experience. Uh, so the materials they were able to keep down to a pretty low cost. Um, plus their labor time. So that, that time versus money part of that is, is sort of a how much is your time worth question and or how quickly do you need it built. If you already have chicks right now and you're gonna want something done in the next couple of weeks, um, then that's something to consider. These others are uh, examples of um, coops that you can buy online. Uh, this top one I hear up here is a company called Eggloo. Um, I'm not a fan of their coops, I'll, I'll just be be honest about that. This version is better than the one that they used to sell. This one at least is is relatively large enough, almost, well, the run is close to large enough for the number of birds that they say. Many of the coops, actually, maybe I'll back up and say this. Many of the coops that you can buy online say that they are appropriately sized for more birds than I think they are sized for. Um, my general guidelines are that you want two two to three square feet per bird of inside coop space, uh, two at a minimum, and you want 12 to 15 square feet per bird of outside run space. 
Uh, none of the coupes that I've seen available for sale online have can satisfy that outdoor space factor. And that one is one of the big ones towards being sure that you have happy, healthy birds. Um, those numbers are a little bit flexible. And I think this is where a lot of the misinformation comes online. Um, when I first started doing this, there was a lot of info out there about uh, like four to six square feet per bird of outdoor space being acceptable. I think that number is true if you have 100 to 200 birds. Because if you're thinking at that scale, that four to six feet per bird goes a lot further. When you're talking about four to six birds, it is way, way, way too small. Uh, so similarly, if you're talking about four birds versus 15 birds, you can start to edge towards the smaller end of those ranges. But so another way of saying that is the smaller your flock, the larger you have to go per bird. The larger your flock, the smaller you can go per bird. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about um, your design. I think that space factor really is one of the biggest indicators of future bird happiness and healthiness um, that I've yet seen, mostly because nearly everyone goes too small to start. Um, and I, I should say I have never ever heard anyone say, gee, I wish I had less space for my birds. So my recommendation is to build as large as you can uh, now, um, that as large as is practical for, for your yard space. Um, the flip side of that is cost. The coops are not cheap. Uh, so this is where the chickens being a cheap pet um, or a cheap, cheap animal to have gets thrown out the window. To build a space that's gonna keep them happy and healthy, which is to say to prevent future cost, uh, either emotional or time or actual money if you decide to take birds to the vet, um, and to make sure that you have happy, healthy birds, it, it does cost some money. Uh, if you're doing it yourself, you can keep those costs down because you can source materials in a way that's a little bit um, more affordable. Uh, and it sort of depends on what your time is worth. And I know a lot of folks have a little extra time available right now, so that could be a, a viable option. Um, so in that case, just keep in mind those, those size um, indications. And I, have, I can give you some other info if you need some more. Um, these are the coops, uh, or some examples of coops that I've installed for clients. So. Um, this, these ones are built by a guy in New Hampshire called Coops for a Cause. He's a great company. I highly recommend him. Um, I did install one coop from him this week that was a little bit lower quality than some that he's made before. So just uh, keep that in mind. But as it is, they're much higher quality than most of what you can get online um, for a reasonable price. Um, he's not currently delivering, so it does mean you'd have to go pick it up in New Hampshire. Um, but that's also something uh, that um, companies like me or there are a couple other um, companies that will do coop installations can do for you. Um, this is a four by four coop this, that I think is big enough for up to six birds. This is a four by six coop, which honestly will fit up to 15 birds, depending on your birds, with a, a second roost added. Um, this run is six by 10, plus you have the area underneath the coop. So you end up with plenty of space. Uh, and again, the run tends to be the limiting factor on how many birds are going to fit happily in that space. Um, predator and pest secure. So uh, this is all hardware, uh, sorry, half inch square hardware cloth, and it's buried all the way around. Um, there are what I call gap free construction. So what I've started doing with these coops, I hadn't done it with this one, but I actually install a backing board around the door here to cover that gap. Um, but otherwise it's uh, pest proof. Um, weather secure. So this is another thing that I strongly recommend is that the run has a covered uh, solid roof on it. Um, because they're confined in this space, if you don't do that, you end up losing most of the footprint of your run uh, when anytime there's, there's wet weather. Um, and so that again doesn't that contributes to the not so happy happy and healthy birds um, you also want to make sure that you're putting it in an area that drains well and you can add sand to the run but if you're in a mucky spot there's only so much you can do without basically adding a bunch of sand and dirt to to raise that above the level of the water in your yard so a, a good draining area is key um, fully installed, uh, it, which is to say if you were to hire me or someone to install this coop, we could do it for around $2,500 just for uh, perspective's sake. Uh, this is my current home coop. 
pardon the fact that I haven't repainted the window sash yet. Um, the plastic is on there for winter. Uh, so that's something that I do with all of my coops to make it nice and cozy in the run and keep the run dry throughout the entire winter. Um, I had, at this point, this was taken just a week ago, just a couple days ago, actually. And I had already taken the, the plastic off of this one section. This other little coop over here, that's a, an older coop that I have on there as a, a an extra space. So that's not part of the package usually. Um, but I use reclaimed materials wherever possible. So these are reclaimed older windows. Um, I try to, to reuse lumber and um, order lumber in appropriate sizes for the sizes that I'll need. So like for example a 12 foot board that then gets cut into a five and a seven instead of two eight foot boards with a bunch of extra cutoffs. Um, this design, so I, I designed mine uh, in a modular way which makes it really easy to um, build off site, uh, flat pack to ship to the site, and then install it. And also makes it really customizable so you can add on extra sections. It's a design that I like a lot um, and I'm working on getting those designs in a way that is available to other people. Right now they're just my sketches. So if you're planning on building a coop in the next couple months, uh, stay tuned because I'll have some of these designs available. But it does, this modular design makes it pretty, really easy to, to customize the sections and to build each section and then assemble it all together. Um, and I think that's all I'm going to say about that. This is the inside, by the way. Having a huge access door, I've, I personally think is also a key feature uh, because it means that you can get all the way in there and clean everything. I, I can and have literally climbed right on up in there like a tree house. Um, and it's uh, really convenient, lots of space. Um, this is my flock, my little happy girls. And um, I am going to skip this one and just talk about winter. So again, you want to be sure that your coop is designed to handle, uh, this picture here was from that winter we had, I don't know what, five, four or five years ago where we got something like 10 feet of snow all within a couple weeks. Um, plan for that. What's the, what's the saying? Uh, plan, for, plan for the worst and hope for the best, right? Um, so you want to make sure that your coop can handle snow. These bottom two ones, by the way, these runs are way too small. These were a couple of the first coops that I installed back when I was using that four to six foot number um, per bird, and it's how I know that that number doesn't work. Um, so keep in mind that these are too small, but note the plastic around this one for, for the winter, like I was saying, um, and just uh, again where you are placing it in terms of where your feed is and bedding is stored and how far you want to shovel to get to um, in the winter time. Um, so um, these are some other references. I, I suppose I'll conclude the, the housing comment by um, saying there's a little more detail in your outline um, and I'm happy to answer some other questions. There's also some other info on some specifics like what, what material to put in your run and whatnot that's on my blog, uh, thechickeness.blogspot.com, which I think is on this slide. Yep, that right there. Um, and of course, if you have other questions, um, feel free to join us in two weeks uh, where we'll talk a little bit more about some of, some of that, um, those details and some other health issues that come up in slightly older birds and some more sort of a, a 201 level um, information and such. And I think I'm going to stop with that because I'm sure that some folks have questions and I know that it's 424 already. Um, so I think we were originally scheduled till 430, but I'm, I'm happy to stick around for a little bit more um, if you guys have time and certainly let me know what questions you have. That was a lot of info. Hey. I, you can raise your hand and I can unmute you. I did figure out the chat box, but I can't enter, I cannot change where we're at right now. All right, Amber, go ahead. And I'm gonna actually do this. Hello. Hi. 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 <laughs> um, so I have a question. How would you cycle chicks in with larger birds? So we're, we're new. So we just have our chicks on order now, but I don't wanna, stop when like I don't want to stop getting eggs when we want to okay so you have an existing flock already not well not yet there are they should be in this week oh I see but you're planning ahead for later um so uh so 
if uh, we'll be talking about that a ton in a couple weeks, but briefly, I, I'll say that um, uh, it is nearly hmm, okay. Nothing's impossible. I have had really, really good success with integrating birds that are already laying age with existing flocks. So that is to say that whenever you get to that point, um, your best bet is to find birds that are already about at laying age, so about six months to a year old, past that point where they've started to lay but still very young. Uh, and then you're going to set up your coop. You're going to do this when it, the ambient temperatures are warm enough at night that they can be outside at night. So this is going to happen probably in uh, summer, you know, late spring to summer, which is when the older birds are available usually anyway. You're going to set up your, your coop such that there's an area that um, the new birds have access to. I usually, so all of my coops are in that um, raised coop with the area underneath it available shape. So I usually wall off the area under the coop and that's where the new birds get to live for their first week or so, that's their home base. And then there's a process that usually takes a, a few weeks. Um, I've been able to do it in as little as three to four weeks, but it's about that long where you can gradually, so you start with that, leave them in there for a little bit, um, let everybody get to know each other through that fencing that you've put up in between them. Uh, and then you can start to, when you let the big girls out into the yard on a supervised basis, you can let the young ones out into the run closed. So again, they're still only interacting through a fence, but then the, the new ones get to know the space a little bit more. And then eventually you let everybody out together. And then eventually once you see that they're acting fine all together, you can teach the, the young birds where the, the coop is and where the roost is and transition to that. And I would say that each of those phases takes at least a week, if not a little bit longer, depending on the personalities of your birds. Um, yep, go ahead. Would you be able, so we have like young kids, so I wanted to get chicks so that the birds could get used to like being around them to not be mean, I guess, when they get older. Sure. Um, would you be able to do it with like newly, you know, the newly feathered birds that you're starting to get in the coop? Yeah, and, and I'll be honest that, um, I mean, especially if you're getting slightly older birds, the, the tameness or not tameness, I find has a lot more to do um, with the, the individual bird's personality and whether or not they've been handled by somebody. Um, and to be honest, uh, the, any that have been um, hatched and, and hand raised uh, at a small scale rather than hatchery level scale, I think tends to be a little bit more tame, though that's not a hard and fast rule. So I think that um, if they've been raised gently and with care by someone, they will be fine and be tame enough with your kids uh, later. I think that's fine. Great. If that makes sense. We have a couple more questions. Next is the someone from the Henry family. Hi, thank you so much for uh, putting this on. I really appreciate it. Hi. Um, we just got our new coop today, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering, what is the preferable roost bar width and length should be? Because I saw a chicken that actually lost toes due to frostbite. So I'm yeah. wondering what the best way and the best roosting bar should be. Totally. So the chicken that lost toes due to frostbite, I can almost guarantee that that bird was on a wire floored cage coop. Some people design uh, a coop with the, the theory is that they can, it allows droppings to fall through, which it doesn't because they're wet and sticky and they just get all stuck on it. Yeah. Um, and so what happened in that instance was that the bird had its, its toes through the wire and was not able to get its feathers over its toes, which is what they usually do. Um, every time that I've seen that happen where they've lost toes, that was, that was the type of situation where their toes were exposed, usually through wire in some way. So, um, to answer your question uh, a bit more directly, uh, I love uh, a two by four, not a, a, so two inches in width. Um, so like a two by four up on end so that the narrow end is up. Uh, I so use a wide two, side vertical. 
wide side vertical. I use a two by four rather than a two by two because depending on the length, um, a birds can be pretty, chickens can be pretty heavy and the two by two just doesn't have enough structure. But a two okay. by four up on its side is great. And I'll take a sanding block or a, you know some um, sandpaper, sanding block makes it really fast. Sand down the edges a little bit. Two by fours are usually already rounded a little, but just to kind of round the edges a little. Um, but all of that said, um, so that, that about two foot uh, or two inch width is great. You can also use a round dowel, but I find those also have some structural issues and they're a little harder to attach sometimes. So, but it's, a, it's an option. Um, all of that said, you will have built your coop so that it's uh, suitable for winter, which means there will be no cross breezes at roost height for the winter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you will not have that issue anyway. Uh, but with that, um, and that really is the key. So for winter, you want plenty of ventilation at the top so that excess moisture can still go and you still have airflow in the coop, but you don't want any cross breeze draftiness. Um, and we often see this, I see this a lot in uh, the seams um, and like around the, if people build an exterior nest box, which are notoriously challenging to weatherproof, it's really hard to get the seams of that from being open. And so then you get breeziness um, at that yeah, we, we just uh, received our coop and it has a tin roof and there are gaps in the top where it connects. And I was going to like fill it, fill it with the foam spray um, uh, just don't, to remove any wasp possibilities. Yeah, uh, wasps are an issue, that's true. I would not use the foam spray because if the chickens can get to any of it, they will peck at it and eat it and it's not super good for them. What I would do is to put... Um, in, and if you're worried about wasps, I would do uh, the hardware cloth across the opening if you want to cover it um, with the window screen mesh ah. along with it too. Because you actually do want those openings at the top end or at least a little bit of it. You could, or you could block part of it like with a board or something for some sections. Okay. Um, but you do want at least some ventilation open on the top, even throughout the winter. What you don't want is the cross breeze at the roosting height. So depending on how tall the coop is relative to where the roosting bars are that may, um, there may be a little bit of finagling to do there. If you want to send me a picture, I'd be glad to, to give a little bit more specific Great. answer too. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, oh, and uh, eight inches per bird of linear roosting space. And also if you have multiple roosts, um, I recommend them being at the same height and make sure that they, they will not be able to reach each other from one to the other. So that means center to center, about a foot and a half apart, um, plus, plus another like six to eight inches on between the roost and the wall for, for their bums. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. More questions. Yep. One more. I'm trying to unmute here. Um, uh, life cycle. Hi. Um, Hello. I have a question about um, the uh, quarantining a bird. So we are going to, we have a extra giant dog crate. So Great. in the event that we need, and we're, we don't, obviously we just have chicks now, so we don't need to yet, but just thinking ahead of time, um, in the event that we need to quarantine a bird, um, and where do we, do we put them in the dog crate and bring them in the house? What, yeah. what do we, yes. Yeah, so usually, um, so like with any creature, like with, with kids, uh, um, if they are sick, if they do need to be quarantine, quarantined, keeping them at a consistent temperature and more importantly, keeping them warm if it's cool out or cool if it's hot out um, so that they're at sort of a, an even temperature is going to be really key to their healing process. So for if you, if you do have a bird in a quarantine setup, um, usually what you are doing is providing as much supportive care as possible. So you're trying to make it as, as easy as possible for that bird's body to do its thing and to get better. Um, so that's, that's usually recovery in some sort, regardless of what sort of treatments you're using. So having a consistent temperature, um, that's sort of the room temperature that tends to be comfortable for us is really good. The other part of it is to keep them um, isolated for stress purposes. So if they are isolated, but but in a way that they're still next to all the rest of their flock and can't get to them, that's really stressful for them. Okay. Not to mention uh, if they have illnesses or if they're sick, the flock will, will go after them a little bit. And this is depending on the personalities of your bird, but that's another prey species, uh, social prey species thing where they will ostracize somebody who's sick. That's actually something I've discovered. If you, if you notice 
and I, I hear this a lot, that suddenly the flock started going after one bird in particular. Almost every single time that I've seen that happen, it's because that bird had some illness going on that the rest of the flock noticed way before we ever would see it. And so that's a really good indication if that happens that that bird is sick and you probably want to bring it in and try to figure out what's going on. So for all of those reasons, you want to set it up inside. You do want to make sure that it's in a place that's, um, again, with the stressfulness that's not super stressful. So if you have kids and dogs and cats and whatever, you're not going to have it in the middle of the living room. <laughs> You'll probably have it like in a, in a room you're not using or at least in a, in a, a space that's a little bit closed off from the, the, the bustle, hustle and bustle of the daily life. And then do we put anything in the quarantine cage with them? Like, do we put a roosting bar in there? What do you do you to can. make it home? Um, food and water is key. And I use that same technique, like with the brooder of putting it up on a platform a little bit. Um, I'm actually, I'm going to show you guys. So I have a chicken that's recovering. She's almost recovered now from a hawk attack from a few weeks ago. And she's not inside right now because she's almost recovered and needed to go out with her, with her kids. But um, can you guys see my video, by the way? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So this is my quarantine cage right now. Um, it has some, some stuff on it, but it's a big rabbit cage. Um, it's in, this is my office. So there's, there's nothing else really going on in here except me hanging out with her during the day, which is good because she gets lonely. Um, but I have food and water on one end and then the other end is covered with a towel for roosting space at night, shavings in the bottom. And that's it. And that's been, been great for her. Um, Depending on the injury, uh, you don't usually need a roosting pole because if they are sick, sick, they probably are going to be better off. Just they'll sort of settle down in the shavings and, and be fine with that. Um, if they are healing from an injury, having the roosting pole in there is great because they, they'll use, assuming it's not a leg related injury, um, a, a low one they might appreciate. But you can sort of, it's not necessary. You can sort of uh, play that by ear depending on whether or not it seems like the bird wants to use it. I actually had one in there for her and she wasn't using it so I took it out. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. We have another question. Just a Great. Second. All right. Yep. Amber. Hi, it's me again. Hi. <laughs> um, so I had a question about if we're going to try to build our own coop just because I want one that will be decent enough for the weather and I can't seem to find one that's like reasonably priced that's not looking too cheap. Sure. Um, and I want them to have enough room also. Um, what type of wood should we use and treated or not treated? Do you need pressurized or? Yeah, um, I don't use treated wood for my coops. I use just plain old pine lumber. Um, I've had uh, one of the, there's a couple design choices that I make that I think helps make that um, okay. Uh, and one of those is that when I design a coop, and let's see if I can share my screen again to show a picture. Um, can you guys see my, my screen? We can see the thank you questions. Great. Okay, so I'm going to back up a little bit here. So oh, it's really hard to see. Um, oh yeah, you can see here. Okay, so uh, I when I build the the coops that I build, so like I said, I build them um, in a, a modular fashion. So each each wall is its own four foot wide section that's totally separate. So they're all you know it's like like putting together puzzle pieces. Um, and I put at each seam between sections, I have paver stones. Um, so it's not it's never in direct contact with the ground. Um, Pay, uh, stone does build up some moisture. So one of the other things that I do is, I don't know if you can see it here, but on all of these, the horizontal piece goes all the way to the edge and the vertical piece is resting on the horizontal piece. So the cut end of the wood is never in direct contact with the, with the paver stone or with dirt. Um, this is not, I'm sure there's probably some data out there showing why, yeah, I mean, this is just sort of something that I came to just because of my experience building things. Um, but I've had my coops last, you know, at this point, uh, 10 years, I think is the longest one from the first one that I put in and they're fine. If you are concerned about it, you can use pet safe paint, um, pet safe and, and outdoor safe paint um, to 
paint the wood, especially the cut ends again before you assemble it, and that will help protect it a little bit more too. Um, the other key part about this is that the entire thing is, um, is has a solid cover over it. So even when it rains, yes, the base will get occasionally like splashed with mud and such, but the wood is never ever ever sitting in water. Um, and so really the moisture really is the key point with this, uh, with wood and, and durability outside. So keeping the wood uh, free from standing water as much as possible is, is the thing that makes just the regular pine lumber last forever. Um, Having said that, some people do choose to use treated wood and you don't have to worry about them eating it like you do with other animals. So with, with chickens, there's some concern about um, chemicals leaching into the soil and I would be, worry about that. Oh, which reminds me to mention lead, which I hadn't mentioned yet. So I'll say that in a second. Um, but if you choose to use treated wood, you don't have to worry about your chickens pecking at the wood and eating it. Um, much uh, at all. So that's not a concern there. It's really if you're just worried about the that material being in their environment. Um, what I didn't say about lead, but I should, is that um, I uh, co-published a study with a couple folks from BU and um, uh, Tufts showing that chickens do pick up lead from the environment and it does get into the eggs. So if you, uh, if you know that you have lead in your soil, um, or if you aren't sure, which here in New England, there's a lot of it in our soil, especially in the, the Boston area or any of our major metropolitan areas in our region. Um, I recommend getting your soil tested, uh, especially in the area where you plan to put the coop. And if you find that there's lead in your soil, you can do exactly what they recommend for, um, for growing uh, vegetables, which is basically you build a raised bed that will be the bottom foot of your coop. Um, build, build that raised bed at whatever your footprint is going to be. Make sure it's really sturdy so it can handle the weight of the coop. Um, put landscape cloth across the bottom and then fill that with clean soil that you know to be lead free. Uh, and then, and actually I would put landscape cloth and probably the hardware cloth wire just to keep the chickens from digging through it. Um, and then that is, that's the substrate that they live in, that they'll dig around in and all that. And then you'll be able to know that their space is lead free. And then be really cautious about where you let them free range around your yard. Because if you have them in the coop that you know is lead free, but then you let them go hang out in the bushes right next to the house where there's a bunch of lead in the soil uh, and they're picking up little pieces of lead paint that flaked off your house, that's, you're sort of negating the, the work you did. So just keep that in mind. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think so. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah, that was sort of the long answer. The short answer is I just use plain pine lumber and it's fine. Keep it away from moisture and you're good. <laughs> okay. Cool. Thank um, you. Other questions? I think I see Tammy has one. I'll go ahead and un unmute yeah. you. Uh, okay. She ra raised her hand in the video, I, not in the... I don't, uh, see, I don't see the other hand that you're supposed to click on. So. Oh, that's I fine. That's good. Um, we just have 13 chicks. They're probably three and a half weeks now. Oh, they're in the awkward teenage phase. Yes. <laughs> and um, so I have a horse barn that I took half of it and put, made a coop. So we have a 10 by 10 okay. and eight foot ceiling. So I can like walk inside there. Um, but the, the run we're making is going to be 1200 square feet and did you say the more space that is that size the amount of chickens you have is not good um hundred yeah that's that's plenty of space for the <laughs> flock that you'll have and that's that's fine okay. yeah that's great um if you wanted you uh, it's very, very rare that I say this, um, but you could go a little smaller if you wanted to. Um, and I'm assuming this, the run that you're building, <clears throat> excuse me, but are you going to cover the entire thing with hardware cloth, the half inch square hardware cloth, or were you planning a different wire material? We bought, I bought the, um, their one inch square galvanized fencing because we're putting up wood fence because, you know, I had a horse before, so the back. Mm -hmm is fencing so we're going to put that um, galvanized fencing against that and come out and around and 
Um, it's going to be how tall? Six feet tall. Okay. Um, Are you planning a solid roof over it? Well, from looking at and listening to this, there's something that we need to consider uh, putting a roof on that somehow. Yeah. I was going to put netting to keep the hawks out. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so you you have both with the, the 10 by 10 coop itself, um, and I think that this is one of this is one of those rare instances, at least for what I, I deal with, where um, because let's see, there's a couple different things. So because of the solid roof on the run factor, um, that may be a reason to go a little smaller, and then that's the space that you can have that solid roof, and that's the space that they have as their their sort of home base. And then if you choose to let them free range otherwise for some portion of the day, then then they have all the space, and that's fine. Um, but either way, yeah, I would definitely recommend putting a solid roof over at least a, a significant portion of that area, if not all of it, um, yeah. if you can. Yeah. And I love those plastic corrugated roofing panels. Um, they're relatively cheap for the, for the size. So like one uh, 26 inch wide by um, 12 foot panel is like 30 bucks. Uh -huh. So it's not too bad in terms of the coop cost. Um, what I will say about the fencing though, so, um, and I hadn't said this previously, but uh, a good gauge to keep in mind is that anything bigger than a dime, a mouse can get through. Anything bigger than a quarter, a rat can get through and so can a weasel, uh, which are some notorious uh, coop predators. So when talking about pests and predators uh, access, note that that one inch, those one inch square openings are not going to keep out mice and rats or um, weasels if you have them in your area. Um, they also will not keep out a, a raccoon hand if they are feeling particularly um, ambitious. Uh, I also do recommend being able to bury wire uh, and this would be the, the half inch hardware cloth or, you know, at least whatever level of pest proofing you you have on the walls to bury it um, around the entire perimeter of your run too. I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but um, but that's also a key point for the, the pest proofing. So in terms of how close it is to your other fence, I would give yourself at least a foot, if not a foot and a half of space around the outside just to be able, the other reason for that too is it's, I, I find that it's good to be able to access the entire perimeter of of a structure without having to potentially take down a fence section. Um, so just to keep that in mind, but yeah, and it's, that doesn't say that, um, that that type of fencing isn't fine. It will work very, very well at keeping your birds in and it will definitely protect against the larger predators like coyotes and foxes and um, hawks from the outside and such um, from the walls anyway. So it's, it's great for that. Just to keep in mind that you might have issues with um, with mice and rats, though, being it that you have a barn, that may already be an issue. So get some good uh, barn, yeah. barn cats. Yeah. Um, so there are ways of dealing with that. They're, they're never going for, so my pests are never going for the birds. They're going for the feed. So yeah. what some people do is if you have your feed, you can structure your feed areas in a way that where the chickens still have free access, but there's not a lot of extra food scattered around and that can help. Um, I've definitely known some people who put the feeder, they have like a separate mouse proof, uh, basically like a, like a 10 gallon or 20 gallon trash can, put your entire feeder in the trash can at night kind of thing. So there are ways to, to deal with it um, if that's how you choose to go. Just acknowledge that it's something that you might have to address. Okay. All right. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. yeah. She said it. So at this point, I am going to stop recording. All right. Um.